afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar, Spray Technology for Edge Growers, a guide to getting it right. My name's Carl Larson from RMCG, one of the deliverers of the, the National Vegetable Extension Network, or VegNet as it's known, uh, down in Victoria, who are running the session today. Um, we've got a really good program with some great guest speakers um, for you lined up. But before we do get stuck into that, a little bit of housekeeping. If you've joined one of these in the past, you might be pretty familiar with the technology. But just to let you know on the go to webinar control panel that you'll see on your screen, uh, either on your, your computer or, or device, you've got um, the opportunity to see other attendees on the line and who's there. Um, your audio controls around your microphone and, and webcam. I've just got everyone muted to reduce background noise at the moment. Um, and you'll see there's uh, some handouts and an area to type in questions if you've got any along the way. We really want this to be a discussion based and practical session. So feel free to type your messages in and questions. They'll come directly to me and I can pop them to the presenters as more of a panel style discussion. Um, and there's a couple of handouts there too that are relevant to the content we're going to cover off on. Just a little bit more around VegNet. Um, it's a series of, of 10 industry development projects that are levy funded in the vegetable industry. So every major growing region across Australia now has um, a series of industry development offices or field offices out there connecting people to the research and development that's um, undertaken through the levy system administered by Hort Innovation. And um, as I mentioned, we're, we're delivering in a couple of regions of Victoria, um, along with East Gippsland Food Cluster, and there's a range of other um, state-based bodies like Ausveg SA and some of the um, grower groups up in Queensland and WA and Northern Territory delivering, um, and the local land services in Sydney as well, really with the aim of getting that cutting edge technology and, and best management practices out to, to growers and on farm. So today we're, we've got Scott Matthew from Syngenta, who's joining us down in Balnaring in the southeast of Melbourne in Victoria. Um, we've got Scott Samwell from Eastbrook Veggie Farms over in South Australia and Mount Barker. He's going to give us the, the grower perspective. And then finally wrapping up with the, the agronomist perspective with Stuart Grigg um, from Stuart Grigg Ag Hawk Consulting, who's actually up on uh, the, the river North Victoria, just outside Robinvale joining us. So a bit of a split um, which is great for these sessions where we can cover a bit of ground without travelling and um, hopefully chime in and provide some, some useful information. So just to give us a bit of a, an understanding of who's on the line, um, I'm just going to launch a very quick poll at the moment. Um, you'll see up on your screen a questionnaire around just how much experience we've all got with spray technology and application. If you wouldn't mind just filling out one of those options, either lots, a bit, not much, or none, keen to know more. That just gives us an idea of, of who's on the line and um, where to pitch some of those messages. So we've got about three quarters of, of us have voted. I'll just close that poll and share the results back with everyone. So we can see there we've got about 20% up the top with lots and pretty big cohort in the in the middle there with a bit, so 70% with a bit. and. Um, None of us with, with no experience. So the, look, that's great. Thanks for filling that out. That just gives us a bit of an idea of where everyone's up to. Um, and I'll now hand over to Scott Matthew. But I'll just share your presentation and uh, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Carl. I yeah, just want to touch base on just a couple of, oh, I suppose, some of the things many of you may have seen me. I, I do a, a few application workshops a year throughout Australia and just touching on some of the key points that I see as being important. So we'll get we'll get Carl just to go to the next slide. Okay, so there's four factors that I really work on and I concentrate on when I'm talking to growers and it's around selecting the correct product. And, and it's one of the common things, oh yeah, I've, I've used the right product and I've done this and I've done that and it hasn't worked. And I'll explain why some of those things might not have occurred. We talk about the recommended dose. So it's about checking the label. It's correctly calibrated equipment. Now, a common question I ask, and it would have been a good poll to, to vote, how many people on, on the line have 
actually manually calibrated their spray equipment in the last 12 months. I've been doing a couple of workshops and it's a scary figure. They say, but my computer tells me what I'm doing. No, unless you're manually calibrating it several times or at least once or twice a year, you can be out by as much as 15, 10, 15, 20%, which can have a big impact on not only developing resistance, but also getting poor efficacy or poor results. It's around getting the rate right for what you're trying to target. So we all know small weeds, less product, big weeds, big, more product. We talk about coverage required. So around the, the spray volume that you need to use, the nozzle, the pressure, droplet size, all that sort of stuff. And one of the most common, the probably most common thing I come across in, in my travels is growers using too high water volumes. We tend to want to irrigate plants, not spray them. And it's one of the most common things that I, I come across, particularly for herbicides, but also fungicides. And, and recently in Virginia, we did a workshop with some growers and, and, you know, we can halve their water rate and we showed them we were getting better coverage. And that's a big efficiency improvement. And we talk about the timing, so getting the timing right, about when we should be spraying a, a downy mildew fungicide or an insecticide or a, a herbicide. So if we click on to the next slide, Cal. <coughs> frozen just on my end or? It may be, I've just clicked over to application timing um, around planned spray programs, Scott. Yep, so I'll, I'll pull up my copy of it. So when, what we what we talk about and people say, oh, you know, I work on a 14 day interval. You know, your planned actual spray interval, um, you know, Scott said, well, the Adelaide Hills chasing or putting on a protected spray uh, to keep disease out, might be working on a, a 10 day program, but if, Scott, as, as happens in the Adelaide Hills or uh, where I was in the Yarra Valley yesterday, you can get significant rainfall events that come in three or four days after you put on your mancozeb or your copper fungicide. And those products are not rain fast, they wash off very quickly. So we've seen at certain times of the year, those products are giving you as little as three or four days protection period. So there's a big area of your spray program that you're potentially unprotected against things. We also know in reality, if you're working on a 14 day spray program, as you can see by the bottom here, you get to day 11, 12 and the wind picks up and you can't spray for three or four days. You just start to spray at day 14 and then the pump blows the seal. And it takes two days to repair that. And then lo and behold, you're just about ready to go. And then you've got to go and attend a sports day or you've got to go away on a trip or something happens. And your 14 day plan spray program suddenly blows out to 16, 18, 20 days leaving a lot of a, unprotected growth and a lot of products that have washed off. So we, you know, I work on, tell growers, you work on a 10 day program and you get to day 10, you can have a look at those things and you can let it blow out a little bit and make sure you're on by day 14. If you, if you run close to the bone and try and get 14 days and I'll start spraying on day 14, things can happen to blow your programs out. So the next slide. Okay. Because when we're, we're talking about fungicide definitions, and it's a, we use some terms very loosely in the industry, we talk about preventative fungicides. They are fungicides that must be applied before the development of the disease. They prevent germination, they prevent penetration into the plant, but they must be on before any of the, any symptoms of the disease that's had a chance to germinate. We then have curative fungicides. They are applied when the disease is already present on the crop, but before symptoms are visible. So that's in the period from when you had your infection event to when you see the symptoms, they are classed as curative fungicides. We then have eradicant fungicides applied to a plant disease after the symptoms become visible. So that's when you have massive big disease lesions, you, you see your crop and it's got downy mildew in it or you've got white blister and you're trying to eradicate the disease. So once you apply after symptoms, you're trying to use an eradicant fungicide. Unfortunately, there are very, very few eradicant fungicides available in the industry anywhere. So we, we tend to use curatives or we have preventative fungicides. And it's very important about understanding, you know, if your crop's got lots of white blister in it or you've got downy mildew, you can stop that disease from spreading to more leaf tissue, but you can't actually get rid of the disease of sarah. It'll actually eventually just burn itself out because it can't consume more leaf tissue. Another important thing to remember, plant tissue cannot repair itself. So once the damage is done, it's done. Okay, so for the next slide. 
we talk about you know the timing and we, we did talk a little bit about that that period there so if you look at this slide there's a lot of products on there but the first part of that before to the left hand side of that line is around the spore germinating it's landing on the leaf it germinates it then grows across the leaf surface it then puts an appressorium down and it starts to penetrate plant tissue and it then starts to colonize plant tissue and then to the right of that line it starts to spiralate and you see symptoms so if, for example there the example with downy mildew at seven degrees that downy mildew disease is in the plant for 21 days from when it affected to when you see the visible symptoms at seven degrees at 22 degrees it's five days you see why when the weather warms up but it's about timing and there's very few curative fungicides for example that are actually active on downy mildew infections but they don't go right out to that eradicant phase because they just don't do that and the vast majority of them and you can see there probably you know the better part 90 percent plus of them must be on before that spore has had a chance to penetrate plant tissue okay the next slide please Similar with insecticides. So we're looking at where insecticides work in the life cycle of a whitefly, for example, with silverleaf whitefly. So if you look at Admiral, the first one there, it's translamor in how it works. It's active on the eggs and the nymphs, but has no activity on adult whitefly. Then you go down to chess, permetrazine has no activity on eggs and nymphs, but is active on the adults. So if you go out and you've got a mixed whitefly infection and you apply chess, You'll think, yeah, that did a really good job. It controlled all the adults. You come back 10 days later, those, those eggs have gone through their development stages and you've got a reinfestation of adults. And you go, oh, that didn't last very long. It didn't control them. So what we're seeing people doing now is we're actually seeing insecticide mixtures going out where they're compatible, where you put out an insecticide that controls the eggs and nymphs and one that controls the adults. So you get a greater control of more of the life cycle. So you tend to get, it takes longer for that insect to reinfest the crop. It's about understanding where all those products work and, and fitting them into a program. Um, and, and it's the same for Lepidoptera species. Some work only when the Lepidoptera insect is feeding. Now, so diamondbacks feeding on plant tissue, they control them. If the diamondback's not feeding, you don't get any control from the insecticide and they're pretty hard to hit directly with the spray. So we'll go on to the next slide. And we talk about, when we talk about application and, and, I, and I talk to growers and I ask them, okay, what's your biological target? So that's referring to what we're trying to control in the crop, whether it be a weed, whether it be a disease or an insect. So a couple of examples, sclerotinia, pythium or weeds. We then talk about the application target is a place where the pesticide spray must be deposited for it to work. So if our biological target is pythium or sclerotinia, they're soil borne diseases, our application target must therefore be the soil surface, not the foliage, because they're soil borne diseases. So we're chasing pythium in, in spinach, for example, and we're trying to use a ritamil application. We need to get that ritamil, the metal axle on the soil, because that's where it's active against the disease. So it's about knowing what you're trying to control and where you need to put what you're putting on in order to achieve control. It's really easy to, easy to mix these two up, and it's quite often where I'll get a grower ring me up and say, I want to mix a fungicide for leaf diseases with a grass selective herbicide. Now, you can potentially do that. You identify your biological targets, but the application targets are different. For a grass selective herbicide, you need to get it right down in the bottom of the crop to control the grass weeds, but you want the fungicide in the top of the crop to control the foliar diseases. So sometimes, they're, they're, from an application target point of view, they aren't actually a compatible application. Okay, the next slide, Carl, please. <clears throat> it's about reaching the target surface. So we talk about, okay, we've identified the, the biological target, the application target. It's about actually hitting that target. And I've done some work in, 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 a, in a lot of crops about changing nozzles, operating pressures, air speeds of wind, you know, wind, air assisted sprayers and all that sort of stuff about maximising penetration into a canopy. And some canopies are quite dense. You could have a, a, potato, a processing potato crop down in Tasmania and it could be waist high and very hard to get penetration into, but you've still got to achieve that. So when I talk to growers, I talk about every canopy of crop has a volume of air in it and we need to displace that volume of air out 
with a volume of air that has chemical in it. And that's what it's about. It's about getting enough air, moving the air out from the canopy and replacing it with air that has chemical in it. If we can do that and we can achieve penetration into the areas of the crop that we need to, we'll get effective and good control. So next slide, Carl. We also talk about droplet size and coverage and there's a lot of labels coming out now saying you must be a medium spray quality and you must do this, you must do that. If you start with a 500 micron droplet and you halve your micron size to 250 micron, you get eight times more droplets. If you go to 125 micron, you get another eight times more droplets. Fantastic from a coverage point of view, but once you start going down a droplet smaller than 250 micron, it's starting to come into the realms of it's a driftable droplet. So it, it can move on air currents, it can move in inversions. It might not hit the target because it starts to become too small. So it's about having a, a good combination of nice heavy droplets that can actually help penetrate and some of those finer droplets to get coverage. And you'll start to see on labels now that they are specifying what spray quality you can use. So, so we'll go to the next slide. It's about understanding also how the products you're applying actually move within the plant or they don't move within the plant and we can see contact or protectant fungicides they spread on the leaf surface of the leaf they stay on the outside of the plant that's where they work they must be on the outside of the plant and they must spread across the surface of the plant and they stop disease spores from germinating and, and growing across the surface we have products that do have some vapor activity so after you apply them they volatilize and the vapor will move around and sometimes that vapor is quite effective at controlling and it's also an additive effect that if you're not quite getting the coverage you should be achieving the vapor can sometimes help with that next slide now we're coming into products that are what we consider or are, are labeled and it's a term you'll see on many fungicides or insecticides the term systemic now systemic is a misused term in the industry, it's a term given to any product that penetrates plant tissue. And it has a big impact. So when, when I say systemic to, to many vegetable growers, you immediately conjure up the thought that it's going to work like Roundup. So it goes up and down the plant, fully mobile. You don't need many droplets. You just got to get a couple on and you're going to get control. It couldn't be further from the truth. So some products that are, are labeled as being systemic are actually translaminar. So they move from the side of the plant they're applied to, to the direct opposite side. So if you can imagine holding a leaf up and sticking a pin through the leaf, that's how they work. They don't move in the leaf, they just move straight through the leaf. The vast majority of our products that are, are, are systemic or labelled systemic can be xylem mobile, so they move outwards from the point of application. So if you put them on the bottom of a leaf, they'll move out to the edge of the leaf. If you put them on a PDL, they'll move up into that leaf. They don't move out of one leaf, come down the PDL and then go up into new growth. So there's only, it's very easy. So the next slide will go through what we determine as, as flow and mobile or fully systemic products. So these move, you can apply them to the roots and they'll go to the foliage. You can apply them to the foliage and they'll go to the roots. So glyphosate's a very good example of a flow and mobile herbicide. It moves both ways. There are only, or there is only one fully systemic insecticide in the Australian market that moves both ways and it's in all the marketing. And, and rightfully so, because it explains the difference for that insecticide to many others, and that's a product called Movento. And you'll see it in their marketing, it moves both ways. There's only one true fungicide that will move both ways in the phloem, and that, that's a phosphonic acid. So agrifos, foliophos, sprayphos, that type of product, it moves both ways. All the other products that you see that have systemic on the label, they're either going to be translaminar or xylem mobile. And when you see a new product come out or you're looking to use a product, Ask your chemical retailer, the label says it's systemic, is it translaminar, is it xylem mobile, or is it fully systemic? And if they don't know, they can certainly follow up with chemical companies like Syngenta or Bayer or Dow, and they'll get those answers for you. So the next slide, please come. So for the guys looking at downy mildew products, these fungicides, these three fungicides are registered for downy mildew control. So you've got metal axle or, or methanoxan ritamil gold on the far left hand side. You've got dimethamorph or acrobat in the middle and you've got chlorothalonil on the outside, which is a protector. The bright red dots on the screen are where the product's applied to. And you can see just how far the product has moved or hasn't moved 72 hours after application. 
And you can see that metal axle is more systemic. It's more xylem mobile. It does move further in the leaf than Acrobat does. And then you see Bravo, or chlorothalonil, doesn't move at all. It binds to the wax on the plant's leaf surface or plant surface, and it gives it its rain fastness ability, but it doesn't move. So I always say to growers, if you're looking to set your sprayer up, set it up to apply your protectant fungicides and you'll get a much, much better job with all the other products that you're using. If you were to set your sprayer up to just deliver a, a systemic xylem mobile product like Ritamil and only put 30 to, to 50 droplets per centimetre squared, you're not going to get a very good job with your Bravo. So set up for the, the, work, the, the hardest one to get right and the one you need the best coverage for and all the others are going to be much more effective than how they perform. The next slide, please. <clears throat> So they were three different modes of action, so three different fungicide mode of actions. And then you, even within fungicides from the same mode of action, so you've got azoxystrobin and you've got pyracolostrobin. Both are applied to the PDL of a potato plant. And you can see azoxystrobin or amistar is quite xylem mobile, will move in the xylem. Pyracolostrobin is really a translaminar product. It doesn't move in the xylem. So you can use amistar and you can sort of if you're not quite as effective on your coverage, you're still going to get a reasonable result from it. You need better coverage to get an effective result out of paraclostrobin. So whilst you get differences between modes of action, you also get differences within the same mode of action fungicide. Next slide, please, Carl. One of the simplest, easiest ways for, for just checking how your coverage is going is some water sensitive paper. It's yellow paper, stick it on your plant, staple it, Clip it however you want to do it, spray it with water, and where the water hits, it turns blue. So you'll see that the, the top water sensitive paper there, you know, it's nice, good, even application. You then come down to the next picture and you can see uneven application. So some water sensitive paper's got a bit on it, some's got more, some's got very little. And you're going to see that throughout a crop. And then you look at the bottom one and you can see what excessive application of water volume looks like. So you can see, and you will see if you put these out in a crop, you will see all of these in your crop when you're spraying. The idea of mucking around or fiddling with your sprayer, working with it, spending some time on it, is trying to get as many in that good even application as you can and minimising the other two. Next slide, please. So just a quick bit on some of the factors that can affect or impact spray application. And the two biggest ones that I work on uh, our temperature and the humidity. So products that need to penetrate into the plant tissue, those being translaminar or xylem mobile or fully systemic, can only penetrate plant tissue while they're in a liquid solution, while that droplet is, dry, is wet on the leaf surface. Once the droplet dries, you get no more uptake. So the higher the temperature, the quicker that droplet dries, and the lower the humidity, the quicker that droplet dries. So you can see there, it's pretty easy to plot it on the graph. You've got relative humidity and you've got temperature. Green is go, orange is exercise caution, red is you probably should think about stopping. And you can see there, I've got some examples. So we go down onto that bottom red line. And if you've got a 200 micron droplet, you've got 41 seconds for the product to get from your spray plant onto the plant and then into the plant. If you go to a 400 micron droplet, you've got a lot longer, but the trade-off is you're not gonna have as many droplets. Whereas if you go to the upper line in the green, you know, that same 200 micron droplet is taking 250 seconds to dry. And the 400 micron is around a thousand seconds. So you're getting much longer up at the higher edge of the green for those droplets to survive. So that's why some insecticide is very important to follow Delta T. So things like Chess, Movento, they are very slow at getting into the plant. So we need to ensure that we keep the droplets wet for as long as we can to allow the most active ingredient to get in the plant where they need to be to work. So it's easy to plot humidity, measure it, temperature, plot it on the graph, green, go, orange, exercise, caution, red, probably think about stopping and coming back at a more acceptable time for spraying. Next slide, please. And it's so just a little bit of a slide if we, if we talk about droplet survival. Simple rule of thumb is if the label tells you to add a wetter or an adjuvant, add the adjuvant the label tells you to add. If it doesn't say to add an adjuvant, there isn't one that's needed. You don't need to stick an adjuvant in every time you spray. If the label doesn't tell you to, please don't put one in. And you can sort of have a look here. It gives you a bit of an example of different droplets or different adjuvants. So you see non-ionic surfactants give you much better spread across the leaf surface. 
not as thick a deposit as, as the water, and then you get the modified organosilicons, fantastic for improving coverage. But one of the things that happens when you've got a thin layer like that, it dries much quicker than a thicker layer. So they, they actually reduce the amount of time that you have for the product to get into the plant. So simple rule of thumb, follow the label directions. If it says to add an adjuvant, add the adjuvant it says to add. I think that might be about it, Cal. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Scott. And, oh, no, uh, and, and just a technique sequence, so yeah. Yeah, do you want to run through that uh, before we go to questions? So feel free to type in those now as um, we finish up with Scott and I can um, put some of those questions yeah. to him. So it's, just, um, yep. so it's just being very mindful about how you're adding products to the tank. So there is a, an order that we suggest a product should be mixed in the tank and you generally need to know the formulation. What Syngenta and, and a couple of our um, counterparts are doing in the industry now is we are making it very clear on chemical labels for new products that are registered what the formulation is. So you should always put your wettable granules in before your wettable powders, before your suspension concentrates, before your emulsifiable concentrates and before your soluble liquids and then your micronutrients and your foliar feeds come last. So it's a strict order and there's a reason for that because if you do it out of order, you can have some compatibility issues and no one wants to be getting inside their spray tank and cleaning out a good gunky mess of hard solidified chemicals. No, a really good um, practical tip to, to end on there, Scott. Thanks for that. Um, Scott, you mentioned before the, the workshop you recently ran with some growers um, on the Northern Adelaide Plains just around uh, water rates um, with the idea that they were improving their coverage with higher water volumes. Do you want to just go into a bit more detail as to what was, what was happening there and, and some of the, the easy fixes that you, you came up with? Yeah, it's, it's one of the things I come across, people think that you need better coverage. The easiest way to do that is to increase your water volume. It gets to a point where you don't get, it's a law of diminishing returns. The more water you put on doesn't always equal an increase in the level of coverage. What it does, is it gets to a point where it actually increases the runoff the plant of the chemical you're trying to apply. So you actually end up with a net loss of product off the plant. So there's a point at which water volumes reach a peak, but you cannot improve coverage and all you're doing is running the risk of losing product. So what we were finding and what we generally find over my time in, in the industry is we've generally found quite often with old technology, growers are putting on significantly high water volumes and some brassica growers might be seven, 800 litres of water a hectare. It's a, it's a big mindset to go in and tell them that I can achieve with a small change of nozzles, and I've worked with Scott previously with, a, with a, just a simple change of nozzles, we can get them down to under 200 litres of water and improve their coverage. And we show them this visually using a fluorescent dye. And anyone's been to a dye nine, it's, it's a very visual message that you can see. Mm. And it doesn't work in all crops. Um, onions are another classic example. We can achieve better coverage with 100 litres of water a hectare in onions than some growers are achieving with their current nozzle setup with 400 litres of water. But it's about going out and, and changing things up, having a look, spending the time. You know, when I when I turn up for an application workshop, I might spend half a day looking at the machine, playing around with it, looking at it, thinking about it, looking at the crop. And that's every time we do that. You, you need to get out, play around, put some dye out, put some water sensitive paper out, change your nozzle pressure, change your nozzles, change the angle of the air, change this, change that, and, and, and see, because the most expensive chemical you buy is the one that doesn't work. Mm, mm. And if you get more effective use out of them, everyone benefits. And, and particularly if you're carting a lot of water around, if you can do eight hectares with your tank instead of four, it's a huge improvement in efficiency. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for that, Scott. We've got another question that's just come through around adjuvant, so I might hold that one off to the end, just in the interest of time. Um, mm. And I'll now hand over to to Scott Samwell, who's um, going to be talking through some of the you know, practical steps around spray equipment itself, you know, how to use it, um, how, to, how to choose it, test it and, and use it properly um, based on some of his recent experience. Um, so Scott, I might hand over to you just to do a, a quick intro to, to Eastbrook and where you are and, and what you're growing and then we can um, launch into the discussion. Okay. So yeah, so uh, my name is Scott Samwell uh, from Eastbrook Vegetable Farms. Uh, I handle all the, the growing um, 
of our vegetables, which are Brussels sprouts and kaolettes. Um, Brussels sprouts um, are quite a hard hard crop to, to spray for, and you need to get good penetration from the, the top of the, the bush to the, to the ground. Um, so we've played around a lot with different uh, spray rigs over the last oh, 60 years, and we've certainly seen a change in technology, uh, both with the, um, the vehicles self-propelled or uh, drag behind trailers through up to um, the equipment we've got now, which is quite state of the art with uh, uh, nozzles and airbags and so forth. Um, our area is in Mount Barker and the Adelaide Hills uh, and also at Langhorns Creek. Uh, and these two areas are, are quite different from each other. Uh, Adelaide Hills has rolling, rolling slopes uh, and uh, a lot higher rainfall. Uh, Langhorns Creek is a lot flatter, uh, sandy conditions and a lot drier. So this, these climates, uh, provide different challenges with uh, with our spray equipment and what size equipment we can go in with. Uh, currently, we're running uh, three different sorts of spray rigs. Uh, we've got two uh, American machines, which are called uh, nitro millers. Uh, we run a 12 meter boom on one of them, which is uh, four wheel drive, all wheel steer, uh, adjustable axles and airbag with air induction nozzles. And our other miller machine is a bigger version of this one at Langhorns Creek. And we run a 36 metre boom with, again, uh, air induction nozzles uh, and no airbag. Um, and we have one more machine, which is an older one, which was uh, custom built for us back in the early 90s when the whole issue of resistance uh, was occurring in, uh, with chemicals. And that there again is an airbag assist, um, assisted boom. However, we're using uh, hollow cone nozzles on that, which is an, an older style nozzle. And that sort of brings me back to a point that Scott made earlier, where we back in the day thought more water, uh, finer droppers to get coverage was critical. And certainly there is, we need to be more careful with that particular um, piece of equipment with uh, drifts and, and runoff because the droppers are so fine and you can. Uh, easily be missing your target. So they're the three pieces of equipment we are, are using. Uh, and as Scott has mentioned, um, it's we find it very critical that it's uh, calibrated each year uh, because even though they, they're running uh, spray, spray controllers, which uh, adjust your rate according to your speed and put out the correct volume, you still get nozzle wear and that's not a even wear across all nozzles. You need to be able to um, manually check each nozzle using, and I use a, just a, a drop tube and uh, a measuring jug and measure each each nozzle for a minute and uh, work out how many milliliters it's putting out per minute. And then you can use your formulas to work out what uh, rates you're doing. And you use the plus or minus 10% uh, variation uh, to uh, determine whether a nozzle is in spec or, or without. So as soon as those nozzles start to wear or they go out of spec, we will replace them to make sure that uh, our, our machine is calibrated correctly because you don't want to be wasting any of the chemical that you're putting out. You want to make sure it's doing the, the job that you're trying to do. Hmm. And Scott, just to jump in there, how long are you spending on, on that manual calibration um, with each of the, your nozzles and, and yeah. deciding when to change things over? Well, look, often we'll, we'll do it at the, the start of the new season. That's sort of the best time to do it. And look, it doesn't take that long. We sort of got it down to probably, you know, the bigger boom takes probably a couple of hours. The smaller booms with only 12 metres, um, it's only got 55 nozzles on it. So it might take you an hour or so to do it. Sometimes you can do it with two guys and, and someone record, you know, recording the water out and another guy noting it down and then you quickly do your calculations. It's, it's quite, once you get into the rhythm of it and knowing how to do it, it's, it's a pretty quick process. And I think it's uh, a good investment in time to be able to quickly do that so that you can make sure your, your equipment or your rigs working into its um, optimal ability. Mm. Great, thanks. I suppose I should also add, um, we've done a lot of testing with the dye. We've also used clay um, 
to go out during the daytime if it's an issue with night. But also, I really enjoy using the, the water sensitive pavers. And uh, the other guys who are online here, um, Mum and up know with Brussels sprouts, they can grow from anything from 60 centimetres high up to, I don't know, a metre, a metre 10 in height. So there's a lot of biomass and a lot of foliage out there. So I've, as um, Scott showed in the slide earlier with the water um, sensitive paper, I've put it at, at different levels throughout the canopy and, and then used our sprayer and ran it at say 500 litres a hectare um, water rate um, and then at 750 and then at 1,000 litres just to see how the, uh, the distribution is throughout the canopy. I've played around with different nozzle sizes, so different air induction nozzles, um, different numbers, um, like numbers two, three, and four are the ones that I um, work with. And our, on, our, on our big sprayer, we've actually got uh, what's called a three-way uh, nozzle body so that we can be, we can accurately put out the correct water rate. So we can change our nozzle sizes to suit the water rate rather than just speed up or slow down the machine to, to try and um, get a sort of a rough uh, water rate change. So it's very handy having a, a three-way body because you can accurately put out um, chemical for the correct uh, application target that you're going for. And the water sensitive paper works really well. You get a very good, uh, real-time uh, measurement of, of how your equipment's going and then it's quite easy to make adjustments and then see if those adjustments are, are working to in your favour. And, and you mentioned earlier in the week, um, Scott, you were getting some some great coverage in, in your purple sprouts with Mankazeb just um, after doing oh, a few yeah. of those. You want to talk us through that particular example? Yeah, so for example, I was out in our field, we also grow a, a purple uh, Brussels sprout. So and that's quite a vivid, dark purple maroon colour. And I was at our property at Langhorns Creek and I happened to note as I was walking through doing my scouting for pest and disease at how well the uh, Mankazeb had um, had covered the leaves, but more importantly, it actually had, had covered down around the stem and then down around the, the the sprout bud that was forming, and I was really pleased to see that. Um, even though uh, it was very easy to see in the daylight with the mancozeb being yellow or yellow beigey colour, you could see it very vividly against the the purple of the stem and the and the fruit, and it showed that we we're getting coverage from the top of the plant. And these plants were about probably 60 centimetres, 70 centimetres high. We we're getting coverage at the top all the way to the, the leaf stem and PDL stems at the base of the plant, which showed that the water rate and the speeds and the nozzle setup we're going that we're using there is, is working very effectively. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned before, Scott, around um, the couple of newer rigs you're running, the nitro millers and the various boom widths, some with airbags, some not, yeah. some with air induction, some not. What, what's your decision making process in, in arriving at, at that particular setup? So uh, the fir the first uh, miller we purchased, uh, we straight away had um, put an airbag on it because that's what our previous sprayer had. It's as Scott was saying, it's all about displacing the the air that's in the canopy with uh, chemically laden air, and we had found that that's the um, a very effective and probably the best way to get get the chemical down, especially down to the base of the plant. In Brussels sprouts, it's it's a challenge because when you've got oh you've got quite a few dozen leaves at various layers and angles, which are going to be blocking the spray jets um, or blocking the the the, um, the spray getting down. So by forcing it down with air, it works very well. However, what's uh, improved is the the nozzle technology and with, with the new air induction nozzles um, we happen to use the Syngenta um, air induction nozzles that's new technology which has come out since the airbag and we found with our other big sprayer um, I was hoping to and it has worked so far we hadn't needed to have the the uh, air assist boom because the air induction nozzle penetrates enough into the canopy and reaches at the base of the ground to be able to provide protection and coverage. Another thing probably which is important to add is that with our spraying, we always make sure that we spray opposite 
to the weeks before spraying so that because of um, the angle with your angle, you don't want to be going the same way the whole time because the plant will always probably have a little bit more um, water rate on one side of it than the other. So we oscillate each week. So one week we go one way and the next week we go the other way. So we're always making sure that the, the, the crop is getting uh, an average coverage throughout the whole growing season. And that seems to be working very effectively as well. Mm, mm. Oh, that's great. And um, any other kind of, if you're going to say like top two or three tips for those say growers that were looking to, to buy new gear or particularly look at changing theirs, what advice would you provide them when, when they're giving you a call and, and you're out, you know, on, on your, um, your own rig or, or in the shed? Look, um, probably it's, uh, it's very important to um, read, the label on the, read the label on the chemical and to understand what, how the chemical works because that will influence how, what sort of equipment you use and, and how you use that. Um, as Scott has said, um, the water rate is really critical. So that will determine a lot on your nozzle size, on, on, on what sort of nozzles you want to do uh, or use and, and then how much water rate you want to do. Very important to be prepared to adjust your um, spraying technique or water rates according to the, the canopy size and the maturity of the plant. Um, it's a complete package. You just can't, exp and you wouldn't, it'd be very foolish to think, oh, I'm gonna go out and get a brand new sprayer and it's gonna solve all my problems. Mm. Having the sprayer is only, you know, one aspect of it. And you probably will need to fine tune it for your application and for your, your farm scenario. So right nozzle size, playing around, like even purchasing a range of nozzles. Um, of, as I said, we've worked closely with, with Scott and we, he's been out with us and we've played around with different nozzle sizes at different rates, use the water sensitive paper and that will help determine, instead of like buying, buying a whole boom of a certain nozzle size, play with this, um, a section of the boom, play around with different nozzle sizes so you can work out what's the optimal and then you can then um, go ahead and sort of do whole farm uh, process like that with, a, with the, the full boom. Um, because of the end, because the nozzle technology has improved so much over the last probably uh, five to ten years, the the air assist is probably not as critical as it used to be. But probably the ultimate spray rig would be an air assisted boom with air induction nozzles, correctly calibrated, is going to get you um, pretty much your your best bang bang for buck. The next step back would be you running air induction nozzles with um, without an airbag um, will probably be your next next best thing. Um, and look, you know, tank sizes and, and boom widths, that's all dependent on, on your terrain um, and your, your your hectares you grow and those sort of things. So um, there are a couple of points. Yeah, fantastic. No, that's great. Um, thanks for those those insights, Scott. I think it's always good to, to get the, that practical you know, on the ground level and we've set the scene um, with, with Scott Matthew from from the application side. I think it's really important to to cover off on the gear and as you said that's only kind of one part of it. You've got to make sure you, you're doing everything around it to make sure you are you know, putting the chemical where it's where it's needed um, at the right time and you're thinking about your own, own production system as well. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, if there's any questions for Scott, feel free to for type them through. Um, we've got a couple that I might hold over because they're relevant to um, Stuart's presentation that we've got coming up next, which I might actually uh, do a bit of a segue into now. So Stuart Grigg um, is a, an independent agronomist and works across uh, Victoria, mainly in, in vegetable crops and talking to us today really about how to best use chemical options um, in your production system and, and addressing some of those common grower questions that he sees um, with his clients and, and out talking to people um, every day. So Stu, I might pass over to you and um, you can take it from there. Thanks very much, Carl, and thanks very much for putting that photo up of me too, holding that lettuce. It looks fantastic. I really appreciate that. <laughs> thought I'd hit that. 
Um, yeah, mates. Um, thanks, thanks everyone for joining in. Actually, I hear that there's 50 plus people actually joining in across Australia. So that's that's a fantastic result. This is obviously a very very important part of part of what we do in our industry. Um, getting the most out of these products, um, they cost us a lot of money. But yeah, I, I'm an independent agronomist, um, largely working throughout Victoria, specialising in, in brassica, lettuce and baby lift crops, for those of you that don't know. And a major part of our work involves scouting crops, identifying cropping issues and making appropriate management recommendations, helping growers out with their day-to-day their -day activities. Uh, we have a focus on IPM. Um, especially in our brassica and uh, our brassica crops, where it works very, very well, and more broadly, ICM, uh, we, where we aim to minimise application of crop protectants and match, maximise their efficacy. And I suppose um, that's where Carl asked me to, to step in and, and just um, give some real life examples of what what I've seen in in, uh, in the years of my involvement in vegetable production. You know, we've had some great presentations here from from both the Scots around spray application, product use, and activity in the crop. Um, explanation around maximising efficacy, uh, machinery and nozzles and, uh, and I'll give a couple of examples, a couple of good examples and a couple of bad examples of um, spray applications um, that I've seen in my time. Um, Scotty spoke about, Scotty, Scott Matthew spoke about um, Delta T's um, early on uh, in the first presentation and um, that's probably one of the areas that, that I've focused on working with the growers that I, I work with. Um, my brother's involved in broadacre uh, production and their water rates are very, very low when we start talking about 30 litres a hectare. Um, they've got to really focus on the, the correct climactic conditions to um, get the most out of the, the um, product they're putting onto their crop or onto their weed. And, and, and what is the Delta T? What's, what's the result of a, of a poor Delta T for us in, in our system? Uh, what can it be? Offsite movement of a crop protectant, reduced e efficacy within our crop, and, and and potentially the need to reapply if we've um, if we've actually had failure. Uh, of uh, one one really bad example of of, of for one example of a, a spray failure that I can remember happened a number of years ago, and it was on a on a day when it was 27 degrees and, and, and some broccoli was being sprayed with success neo at a, at a crucial buttoning stage. The wind was blowing northerly, probably at about you know, 20 kilometres an hour, not, not, not a great, great conditions. It was about 11 o'clock in the morning, quite dry. And, and I guess what was the Delta T at that range? And if we can um, blow up this chart that Carl's got, or, or maybe not, we can sort of see that if we put about 25 degrees or 27 degrees in at about a sort of a 30% relative humidity, we're well into the suboptimal range. And now that, that success neo application was a, was a complete failure. Um, there was platella underneath the buttons on those, on those broccoli crops, and it was, it was quite nasty, the result. Uh, we expected um, that to work at perfect timing you know, seven days later, but um, but it, it wasn't, didn't occur. The product physically, you know, when we think about it, the product was was unable to probably make enough of that get enough of that product from the um, from the sprayer to the leaf in the first place to the crop to where it needed to go. And then, how long did the actual product stay on the leaf wet to be absorbed by the plant? Um, so there were some real challenges there. I've got a really good example of a, of a grower who uses um, the BTs in, in brassica production, and um, and John's an absolute cracker. He um, he's a small grower. He grows on 50 to, to 60 acres, um, producing um, broccoli and cauliflowers. And and John um, had some had some issues with some applications of um, the crop protectants um, over the years periodically. And uh, when we started discussing Delta T with John a few years ago, he hadn't heard of it. Um, we started talking about you know application um, whether we were actually getting the correct water rate over the crop and that looked quite good and we started started looking at um, how he was actually getting it to the crop where it was sitting on the leaf then we looked at UV sensitivity of that product and uh, and and actually holding it wet on that on, on that crop um, John now religiously looks at his um, his Delta T uh, before he goes out on sprays and, and sprays if he's putting on a BT it'll be you know, quite often after dinner and in the in the summer, it can be on a Friday night if he needs to. But but his um, effectiveness when he uses his BT crop BT products is somewhere between 90 and 95 percent. I would say he, he's he's an absolute fantastic result um, in actually really focusing on targeting when to apply a particular product to get the most out of it. 
Um, we actually reduced his, his accountant told us we reduced his chemical bill in the first year we worked with him for tw by $20,000, which was a, a huge result. Um, yeah, I've got another example of a, of, a, of a chess application that went on on a, um, a, about 8 o'clock on a Thursday morning. Um, Grower thought they were doing the right thing by applying their, um, their, their chess early in the day. Um, that day happened to be 30 degrees. The chess just didn't actually get it to the crop and stay on the crop long enough to be effective. Um, that you know, chess takes quite a while to actually work into the, the plant system and, and become fully effective. We were waiting for this product to start working. And, and, and two weeks later, it hadn't done what it should have, so we had to go in there and reapply, costing that grower more money. So, so I guess um, it sort of led us to um, discuss that Delta T a lot more with a lot of the growers that we work with and, um, and look at the products that they're using that need to then actually physically get into the crop, like you know, Scotty mentioned, the, the, um, the Moventos and the, uh, and the Chesses and you know, a lot of these newer chemistries as well around um, Lepidopteran insect control. Um, just trying to really target when we apply them to maximise um, our, our efficacy and get the biggest bang for buck. And there's a couple of simple little um, little systems that, that we can use and that I've encouraged um, um, growers to use uh, that we work with. Um, and one, one really simple system is the Elders Weather App. Um, the Elders Weather App is available to all of us. It's a free app to download. Um, it, it's got a great little, um, it's, it's the normal weather data, but it's also got a little um, Delta T um, thing down the bottom. Carl, if you can bring up that slide. Yeah, we can actually see, um, this is a screenshot that I took yesterday on my phone showing the second from the bottom on the, on, on the um, left-hand image, second from the bottom right-hand corner on the left-hand image, we can see a Delta T of 2.8 at the time that I took that screen grab. Um, so, I mean, I, I, we normally try and start a conversation with, with the growers that I work with, we want to try and spray some, well, ideally between two and eight, but I try and shorten that up to three to seven. And if we shorten it up to three to seven and we tell the spray operator that they need to spray between a delta T of three and seven, if it gets outside that range, they, they've got some flexibility to then ask their manager and see where we go from there, uh, whether we should keep spraying, whether we should um, look at the products that we're using, whether they're going to be effective. Um, and it's just a really good sort of um, start for to, to, to maximise our efficacy of products and minimise those failures. You can see on the right hand side image there, it's actually got a forecast of where the delta T will be at, uh, what is it, each, uh, each three hours over the next 24 hours. So you can actually really allow some good um, um, targeting of, of spray applications and some really good scheduling of staff as well within the business. And I suppose the, the other, the next one that um, Carl's going to pop up, the next little slide, is around a, a, um, a web-based um, web system called Spraywise Decisions. And Spraywise Decisions has been put out by, by New Farm, um, probably largely targeted at the, um, at the broadacre um, sector, but still very applicable to us in, um, in, um, in the veg industry. Spraywise Decisions works on a, on a five-day uh, weather forecast. Um, it's, a, it's an indication tool, it it's identi helps us identify when those best spray windows are going to occur in the next five days based on our delta T, wind um, and, and climactic conditions. And then it's actually looking at when it, it highlights our, our, our optimal conditions or it looks at the conditions and gives them a, a, a red, a green or I think an amber as well. And then it also, um, it, that'll tell us when the delta T is right, but then it also overlays that with weather conditions in terms of wind. Um, and, and other, other challenges that we may face. So we can actually really schedule our staff in around when we can apply these products and get the absolute most out of them. Um, it's, it's a really brilliant little um, management system. It's a, it's a subscription service. Um, it's a um, yeah, really good management tool, available at spraywisedecisions.com.au. So um, yeah, I can't recommend um, either of those two systems more, more highly. Mm. That's fantastic. Thanks, Stu. And I think some, some great um, practical examples there, just of the case studies you've provided around where things, you know, have worked well and also, you know, where they haven't. You mentioned, um, Stuart, just with using, say, something like the Elders Weather app and mm -hmm. using that range of Delta T between three and seven as, as the guide for the spray op operators and then anything outside of that, having the discussion with their, you know, their managers or supervisors. It is one of the big questions, isn't it? Like, what do you do when there are suboptimal conditions and, and you're falling outside of that range or, or you don't necessarily know the Delta T? I mean, what are you, um, 
advising or, or providing recommendations on when that happens or when growers are asking you that question? Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, first of all, it's really important that the um, the spray operators are checking that delta T. I think it's a requirement of legislation to be to be looking at what it is um, for wind speed and temperature and that sort of thing. Um, it, I, I'm not saying the, the ideal delta T is obviously uh, we we look at you know two to eight, but I'm just I shorten it up to three to seven just so that we give a, a bit of flexibility in the management decisions as well. Um, it's just to create conversation from the um, from the uh, applicator back to the, the, the manager as well. Um, when we're outside those um, um, ideal um, spray conditions, then we've got to have a serious conversation as to whether we apply or not and what the product is that we're applying. Um, like um, Scotty Matthews was talking about earlier, whether we're talking about a chlorothalonol, which is a protectant fungicide, which only really needs to go on the outside of the leaf. We actually don't need, um, we're not relying on, on any uh, product uptake into the crop itself. So maybe uh, we can up our water rate in, in that instance to actually get a little, get, make sure we get some more of the product to the leaf. Um, but, but once it's on the leaf and dried on the leaf, then hopefully it's staying on the leaf and we're not going to wash it off straight away. We're not relying on that product to sit on the leaf wet for a period of time to actually be uptaken. So it will be about looking at the product that you're actually using and saying, should we still be putting it on or, and, or should we not? And what's our target? Have we got a significant um, uh, occurrence of a pest or a disease that we really need to actually make sure that we're getting the product on there to maximise its efficacy? Yeah, no, that's great. And Scott, Samuel, I might pass over to you if, you, if you've got anything to add there, just at um, you know, your individual um, farm level, you know, obviously we, you don't live in an ideal world day to day. How are you tackling that, that issue? Oh, look, um, certainly sometimes when the pest pressure is extremely high, we would not be spraying in um, probably the ideal conditions. Um, However, using products like you know Chess and Mavento, which um, I've had the same experience with Chess, where it just has not worked, and I would say from uh, hasn't worked because of uh, my poor understanding of the product and applying it in the wrong wrong um, conditions. But since then, we we will do a lot of spraying at night, if especially through the summer periods, if weather conditions aren't conducive, we will revert to um, nighttime spraying to make sure that every spray we're doing counts. I suppose as Chemicals are getting more expensive. Operating costs are getting more expensive. We we have to be more accurate with our um, application timings, and they become more critical. Uh, so it's probably being it's becoming smart and wise, and actually having to spray when it's when it's suitable and making sure that happens. So you know it is it is a Friday night, it is a Saturday night, it is a Sunday night. We mm. you spray when when it require is required to sort of get optimal um, uh, conditions for it. Um, that's sort of the way it's having to, 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 to be to be successful. I think. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I might just hand over to Scott Matthews there too, just to to provide any additional points, um, Scott, just on that issue of, of suboptimal conditions. Yeah, look, Scott Samuel touched on a very important point. Sometimes timing is the most important thing. If your diamond back moth or your aphids or your white fly are at the most susceptible time, you need to apply. You, you can do things, but you've got to remember whatever you do is going to have a trade-off. So if you need a bigger, if you need more time, the delta T is a little bit marginal and you want a, a bit more drying time, you produce a bigger droplet, the bigger droplet takes longer to evaporate. It stays wetter for longer, but you produce fewer of them. You can, you know, go out and spray if you can possibly get in the, the property after an irrigation, soon after an irrigation, irrigating the soil will increase the humidity in and around the canopy. You can increase your water rate, like Stewie said, and increasing the water rate increases the humidity and slows the drying down a little bit. You can select an adjuvant if it's feasible, like a, an oil that they mix with Movento, and that's done to reduce the, the drying time. So there's lots of things you can do, but everything you do has a, has a reaction somewhere else. So if it's a bigger droplet, you lose coverage. If it's a higher water volume, sometimes you might get a little bit of runoff. There's, if it's uh, put an oil with it, you don't get quite the spread over a leaf surface, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just about playing that trade off and sometimes timing's the thing you're needing to achieve. And if you get that right, you'll get a good result. You might not get as good a result if you had it done on undo tea, but you know, where I live in, in the Riverland, you don't get many hours a day where you've got ideal delta T. 
because we're mm-hmm. so warm and you know it, it's really dry and there's no humidity in the air at all. So sometimes mm-hmm. you just got to spray. No, absolutely. And look, that's um, probably a, a really good place to, to finish up and, and given the time, we, we've made the promise to have the, the hour session and, and make it pretty punchy over lunchtime and we've exhausted that. I feel like uh, with the panel discussion, you can kind of talk on these issues um, you know, for a much longer time. But uh, look, apologies if we didn't get to a couple of those questions, but um, thanks very much for, for joining us. Um, also, a big thanks to our um, presenters as well, Scott Matthew from St. Jecha, Scott, Scott Samwell from Eastbrook Vegetable Farm, and uh, Stuart Grigg as well from Stuart Grigg Agcourt Consulting. Uh, these sessions don't happen without the, the generosity and, and um, expertise of, of the guys on the line, so thank you very much for that. Um, this is webinar number two of, of four in the national series, so in August we're, we're tackling um, robotics and automation um, on the 23rd of, 3rd of August and you'll see on the screen there uh, a registration link if you wanted to take part in that one and then also IPM uh, later in the year in October will be a, a session on, on how to best manage um, insect pests and in a more sustainable approach. So thanks again for joining us um, and we hope to see you at the next webinar. Thanks everyone.